So hello and welcome to Lecture 8. Uh, what we're doing in Lecture 8 is we'll do a brief uh, example on how to do uh, a chi-squared fit for a Gaussian peak. Uh, and then we'll do it in Excel, and then we'll do it very briefly in MATLAB where it's, everything will be nice and simple and easy. So uh, we've got uh, our chi-squared as being the sum of the residuals squared when all penalized by their uncertainties. And, um, so those are the uncertainties in each of the data points. And um, we then said that we would take the derivative of chi-squared with respect to A to find the position where we minimize all of the uncertainties. Um, and we'd have to do that for each of the AJs and go down a vector in chi-squared space. So we differentiate that and we get this function, which means we need to evaluate the derivative of the function with respect to the AJs, the fitting parameters. Um, so here's a, a, an example of a function. This is a Gaussian. Um, it has a background intensity b. Um, it has a, a e, e to the minus x squared over 2 sigma squared, where sigma is now the width. It's a different sigma to the uncertainties. Sorry, it's the notation people use. Um, it's centered at a position xp, got a characteristic width sigma. Um, it's got an intensity i, because if I, we proved before that if we integrate just that, that's got an area of 1, so when I multiply by i, the area of it, excluding the background, is i. Um, and then we've got a background here, and that's the sort of equation you'd use to fit a diffraction peak, for instance. We've got some scattering, detector error losses, and so on, uh, which gives us some background intensity. Uh, when we've got a nice peak, and we want to find out typically where the peak is and how big it is. Um, so what we need to do is evaluate dfda. Um, fine, okay, so we'll, and then we can uh, find the residual for every one of our measurement points, penalized by the uncertainties, multiply by dfda, add them all up, and then we'll have an estimate for the gradient of chi square with respect to a. Um, so let's do our differential. Well, we'll start off easy, df by db, it's just one, it's nice. Uh, df by di, it's the next easiest one. Um, that just gives me 1 over sigma root 2 pi times the exponential, that's p squared divided by 2 sigma squared. Okay, now we need to do df by, let's do xp next. Um, so the b disappears, the i over the sigma root 2 pi stays where it is. Uh, the exponential will be undisturbed. And then we'll get the differential of the exponential. So we've got to differentiate that. Well, the 2 sigma squared doesn't have anything to do with anything. Then we've just got to differentiate that, and we'll get twice x minus xp, and we'll get a minus sign out of differentiating x minus xp, which will cancel with that minus sign. So times minus 1 squared disappears. And the 2s will cancel here, so we'll end up with an answer of i over sigma cubed square root of 2 pi times x minus xp um, times the exponential x minus xp squared divided by 2 sigma squared. Okay, and the last one we need to evaluate is going to be df by d sigma, which is going to be awkward because sigma appears twice in our equation. As before, uh, the b disappears, the i over 2 root 2 pi is going to be in all of them, and actually the exponential is going to be in all of them, so I'm just going to write that out. Squared divided by 2 sigma squared times 1 over sigma, well that differentiates to minus uh, sigma to the minus 2. Okay, so that's easy. Then I've got to differentiate that with respect to sigma. Well, that's equal to minus x minus xp squared over 2, well, times uh, over 2 times sigma to the minus 2, and that's going to give me minus 2 sigma to the minus 3. So minus 
2 sigma to the minus 3 times this guy, which is minus 1 times x minus xp squared over 2. And then the 2's cancel, the minus 1 cancel, and I've got sigma to the minus 3, and I've got an additional sigma from there, which I have to remember. Bing. So, when I multiply that all out, this big bracket here, that's just x minus xp squared over sigma to the 4 minus 1 over sigma squared. And that's what my bracket is there, so I'm just going to put that on the end here. So that's x minus xp squared over sigma to the 4 minus 1 over sigma squared. Boom. Go away. So, those are all the differentials, um, and now all we need to do, having got all the differentials, is we're going to build our sum, i equals 1 to n for all our observations, of the uh, difference divided by the uncertainty squared, which is different from this width, times df d, uh, sigma, df db, df di, df, df dxp for all those four possible aj's, and then we'll have our gradient of how chi-squared varies with, I need a four-dimensional, four axes here. I don't have enough, enough possible space, but if there are only two, I'd be finding d chi-squared and going down the gradient, but I'm doing it for four-dimensional space. So it's going to be a bit of a pig, but we can do it numerically. So we'll go and do that now in Excel. Um, before that, um, we should probably uh, comment again um, uh, there are more sophisticated approaches than the steepest descent method we use in Excel, and we'll use those when they're coded into MATLAB, but the math for them is a bit much at this stage. You need to do grad, you need to do second differential matrices, and so on. And so that's really the next year at least before you can do that. So we'll just do the steepest descent method for now in Excel, and then we'll show you how to do it uh, in MATLAB in a very few clicks indeed. Um, so I'll see you for the Excel bit. So this is uh, the Excel file for fitting a Gaussian to some data. Um, here I've uh, got some diffraction data. Um, it's from a diffraction experiment at the Diamond X-ray Synchrotron in Oxfordshire, uh, where we were measuring a, an austenitic steel. Uh, and this is its 111 peak. Um, the 2 theta position is uh, in a, a fairly low angle, um, because uh, the wavelength of the radiation we used was rather small. Um, so we end up with a rather small diffraction angle. Lambda is 2d sine theta. So if lambda is small, 2 theta is small. Um, and here is our fit. Our, our data is here in blue. Um, and uh, it's plotted as x and y here. Um, our, data is in, our input data is in blue. Actually, I've only got the starting point here, the increment. And then it just increments up, as you see here. Uh, I'm taking the uncertainty of the data points as being uh, the square root of the intensity, um, which is uh, by theorem that's that's true, that's the right thing to do. I haven't lectured it, but there you go. Um, and I'm having a, an initial guess for the parameters of my uh, Gaussian, which are here. So I've got a background number, um, I'm actually guessing that they're there, a background number of 340. Um, uh, let's put them in. 3.92, 0.015, uh, 2,340. And uh, I make my initial fit um, based on that. Um, and that's going to be the background. And then the equation is here. But this is I, that's C7, um, uh, divided by sigma times the square root of 2 pi. Um, sigma being the sort of characteristic width of the Gaussian times the exponential of x minus x bar squared or xp, the position, peak position, the fitted peak position which is in C5 divided by 2 sigma squared. Uh, the purpose of the sigma in the pre-exponential there is to normalize it to an area of 1. Um, so then the uh, intensity here is the integrated intensity, the area of the peak um, apart from the background. So we've got a peak sitting above some background and the background intensity is due to scattering around the, the, the room in which the detector was sitting and so on and so forth. Noise in the detector, that sort of thing. Um, so that's our, our initial 
and then I have a current fit which is the same thing but I, what I've done is I've made um, that it is sitting there based and I've put the exponential e to the uh, the exponential times 1 over the square root of 2 pi there and then I've made the current fit of that uh, background plus intensity over sigma times this guy so this column is my current this column here is my current fit to my data um, and I plot that as the orange data over here um, so when I plot that that's that data there um, then I have a column here which is the uh, residual um, so it's the difference between the fit and the data divided by the uncertainty squared uh, for each of the points and I can um, then plot those that's my residual there um, I actually plot it as uh, divided by the uncertainty squared but the absolute y minus y fit so that's plus or minus whereas here this residual is taking the square of the y minus y fit and I add all those up uh, to get chi-squared um, and actually I've, I've, I've fiddled chi-squared because I've uh, divided by the square root of the number of observations uh, and I've multiplied by the width so that's my dx between each one um, just to get that into a more happy sort of number and it's currently running at something like 25 million for chi-squared um, and here's my residual this is my blue data um, and you can see I've got a, 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 a more or less zero difference um, and then my peak is slightly too far to the right so I've negative when I'm uh, over here and my peak's also a bit too broad the one I'm fitting so I'm slightly negative off to the left of the peak as well here um, then I can uh, work out df by db which is one and multiply it by uh, the residual um, and that's going to, when I add all of those up, that's going to be, oops, when I add all those up, that's going to be my estimate, um, and I multiply it by the count and the increment, just to make, again, to make the number a bit nicer. Um, that's going to be my estimate for how far, or the extent to which B should, the background number should move. Um, I divide that by its current value, just to ask it, is that a long way or not, and I have a tuning parameter here. Uh, so then when I make my new estimate of B, I take, um, I've got an if statement in here just to avoid things going negative, but what I do is I take the amount it should move times my tuning parameter and I add that on to my existing value and that's my next guess. I do that for all of the differentials, so that's df by uh, uh, dx, uh, the peak position, that's the uh, df d Gaussian if you like by d sigma, the width, df by the intensity uh, and that gives me all of the betas all of the shifts and lets me calculate all of the ones in my next guess and then just for fun I calculate my next fit here my next exponential that's the equivalent um, of where has it gone column i uh, my next fit value there that's my equivalent of uh, column f and my next residual that's my equivalent of uh, column G and that's going to be my next chi-squared so using my next guess of values I'll get a chi-squared here that is um, something like f uh, half a million rather than 25 million before so it's gone down apparently my change in chi-squared has gone down by 98% so then what I do is I uh, and this is iteration 0 the next one's iteration 1 uh, so then I'm going to copy those numbers and I'm going to edit paste special and I'm just going to insert those values my, my next guess into my current guess and my current guess goes there so now my that has taken my peak and it's moved it across a little bit um, so it's now a bit better in terms of the center um, I've moved uh, the sigma down a bit it's got a bit less wide it's not all the way there yet um, the intensity's got a bit smaller um, and uh, it's gone down from 2000 to 1600 because um, as I've made the peak a bit narrower it will have got a bit taller which means the intensity needs to get a bit smaller and it's, it's taken the background up and I can do that again by going control Y and that will get me my third iteration, my second iteration and you can see here that this peak is too wide I've got a, a double uh, negative on either side of the peak and then it comes up in the middle where it's a bit closer 
it's a bit too small and it's too high on either side and too small in the middle so I'm finding the center quite well but I'm a bit too broad um, and as I do it again it gets a bit better chi squared's coming down it's now only 90,000 um, it's getting a bit better 48,000 getting a bit better 24,000 getting a bit better getting a bit better and I can keep on going um, keep going keep going keep going keep going now I'm getting into quite small changes um, and I'll keep going should get down to about two and a half thousand here um, you can see I'm really getting into quite small changes now and really I'm only changing the width at this point um, and I'll keep doing it until everything stops changes stops changing mm, not really changing anymore anymore so now my chi squared's about two and a half thousand um, and I can I can do a, a, a few checks I can say um, if I copy those values into my initial guess edit paste special values yeah if I do a bit of hand tooling here if I go for uh, f I, I happen to know that the right answer for the background is about 590 um, that's quite a bit better there chi squared um, if I go uh, 600 gets a bit worse if I go 580 gets a bit worse 590 uh, is about the optimum 592 591 589 588 589 590 looks like it's about the right number uh, if I try fiddling by hand with the width if I go 1430 doesn't really get better 1420 was was better as we had 1410 worse again so 1420 is about the right answer um, and if I try changing the width it won't get any better and the same is true for XP so my uncertainty in XP here seems to be about something like uh, 10 to the minus 5 um, so that's a fractional uncertainty of uh, 10 to the minus 5 uh, divided by 3.9 so that's an uncertainty of about 25 times 10 to the minus 6 um, which is a, a really, really good answer. Actually, it's a really good peak fit. But that, on the other hand, it's a very nice peak. Um, and uh, and we see that we can get a nice fit there. Um, and that's about optimum. Now you see actually that the uh, the tails of the peak, the blue, are quite a bit larger than the Gaussian. And that's a common feature for diffraction data. Actually, you should really use a, a peak description that's a bit wider at the tails, uh, which is a, a function called a pseudo void. Um, and uh, probably you also see the background is, is tailing away. And that's because there is quite a bit of diffraction quite some way away from my peak. Um, now, as another example, if I went and computed uh, for a uh, initial position of 3.7, um, you'd see that my peak's in completely the wrong place. And now there's no way when you're computing the gradient of chi-squared that you can know which way you should go. So uh, if I try and do the iteration then, I'll, I'll make that iteration zero. If I try and do the iteration now from that starting point, let's see what happens. Um, so now, oh, it's made the peak a lot broader and a lot smaller. If I do that again and again, it now just makes the peak really, really small and that's going to tend to go badly, badly, badly wrong. So if I don't start off with a, an estimate for the peak position in about the right place, the whole thing is going to go pear-shaped. So I've got to start off with a decent initial guess. Let me just get back to where I was before. So there's my fitted solution. Um, if I don't have a decent initial guess that overlaps with the peak somewhat, when I do my differential of chi-squared with respect to each parameter, I'm not going to know which way to go um, on this steepest descent method. And so it's not going to work out very well. And that's a, a general problem for this sort of fitting. You need a good initial guess 
Uh, there are ways you could generate it. You could imagine for this sort of data, you could go through and ask where the maximum was in the data and take that as your initial guess for the peak position. Uh, then you could ask how far you had to go to decline by a factor of 1 over e and use that as your width parameter and so on and so forth. You could take a, the background some large distance away from the peak then to find out what you your get starting guess for the background was and so on and so forth. And that would all work quite nicely. Um, but it is important um, and it's a big feature of these methods is that you need a good initial guess. Uh, so that's it for, for this. Um, there are a few other comments to make. Um, uh, the fitting procedure can be improved by using the curvature of the function chi-squared rather than just the gradient of chi-squared. And that means you form a matrix of the partial derivatives d chi-squared d um, intensity squared, d chi-squared d intensity db, d chi-squared d d2 uh, chi-squared d uh, intensity d sigma and so on. Um, all of the possible second, deriv second partial derivatives of, of chi-squared. And then you would put them into a matrix, which is called the Hessian, uh, which you would then invert, and then you would then use that um, curvature matrix to find, help you find where the minimum was likely to be. Um, but uh, since you don't know about how to form the Hessian and, and how to find curvatures and so on in a multidimensional space, let's not go there. This is the simplest possible nonlinearly squares we could make. Um, but if you look into MATLAB or something like that, when they're using things called the Levenberg Marquardt method and so on, they will tend to, or the Newton method, or the PFGS method, whatever they like, um, they will tend to be using those sorts of solvers. Um, the other thing to uh, comment would be um, something from John von Neumann. And he remarked that with four parameters I can fit an elephant, and with five I can make him wiggle his, wiggle his trunk. Um, that is, if you have enough fitting parameters, you can fit any data you like. And this is really rather a big problem in experimental science. We uh, can think up rather complicated physical models with a lot of physical parameters in them. Um, and unless we know what those are a priori, we can fit the behavior of our data and overfit it um, and fit a very funny curve um, where, and the parameters then end up being physically meaningless. Um, so that tends to bias us towards developing models that are the simplest possible models and whereas many of the parameters are independently measurable um, so if we think about um, something like strength you know, if we have a, a, a model for uh, what the effect of solutes should be on the strength we could measure that independently of our given alloy or something like that um, or we try and do it from density functional theory model or something um, but uh, we would try and take care to make physically based models whereas few of the uh, fitting parameters were actually true fitting parameters and as many of them were physical numbers we could measure in some different experiments. Um, and uh, that's a, a real art in making physical models. Um, and as a, a last comment I'd say you should always do this sort of graph where you can plot the original data, that's the blue, um, the model fit, that's the orange, and the difference between them, um, uh, such that you can visually verify that your fit is good. And if your visual verification fails, you know that your fit is bad and that you need to uh, do something else and the, the fitting parameters you've generated are garbage. Um, if you don't look at them and just let it fit blindly, then you will tend to produce garbage data and results that are wrong. Um, and uh, uh, the last comment I'd make is, of course, the residuals are very important. Um, and if you know d chi squared, if you can do the second derivative of chi squared, you can also come up, it's outside the scope of this course really, but you can also come up with estimates for the uncertainties in the fitting parameters um, and a likelihood of, how, of confidence in your fit, although those things tend to be, uh, need to be handled with care. Uh, so that's it for this video. That's how you fit a Gaussian. In the next one, we'll look at briefly at how to do this in MATLAB in about five seconds. So, uh, see you then. So what we're going to do now is we're going to fit that same diffraction data using MATLAB. And uh, I've saved the data, which you can access online, um, in uh, an XY file. And we can just import that data here um, using the import tool. Um, go and find it in my hierarchy. Um, and somewhere around here, oops, um, so you 
the one on one data analysis, compared to data, <coughs> and up it pops. And we'll call the variables x for the x axis, y for the intensities, and uh, we'll import. There we go, done. So we've got the x and y data there. And I'm going to define the y uncertainty as being uh, the square root of y. Boom, that gives me y uncertainty. Then I'm going to go into apps, I'm going to get out the curve fitting app. And that will pop up in due course. Dum -de dum Here we go, there it is. And if I take my x data as being x, my y data as being y, my weights as being the uncertainties, and I'm going to choose a custom equation. And my custom equation I have written down already. It's our Gaussian from our uh, previous data. So that's the background plus an intensity over sigma being the width times 1 over the square root of 2 pi um, times the exponential of x minus x position the peak squared divided by 2 sigma squared. And uh, then we need some fit options and we will give it some values. So we'll start off with a, a background we reckon it's something like 400. An intensity, give it something like 2000 to start off with. A width, uh, something like 0.01, say. Uh, an x peak, something like 3.91, something like that. Um, and then it fits the peak quite nicely. Away we go. Um, and uh, we can make that robust. Um, and that's us done, boom. Um, so we close that, and uh, then we have our uh, xp, something like 3.912 there, plus or minus the square root of nothing. So um, we're very, very certain about this fit. Um, our width is 0.009, um, which is about what we found before. Our intensity is about 1441, our background is about 530, and that's our fit. Um, uh, the same sort of things as we had before. Uh, the data uh, doesn't fit perfectly to a Gaussian. Uh, but if we're only interested in the centre and the intensity, we don't really mind. Um, and uh, then we can get very good determinations of the position of a peak very, very fast. Um, so the uncertainty here is, let's call it 0.0005, 305, um, divided by 3.9. That's a factor of something like uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 4. Um, so it, and it's better than that, it's better than 10 to the minus 4. Um, so uh, that's really very, very good. And notice that we can fit um, our position far better than our peak. Our peak is something like um, uh, 10 to the minus 2 wide, but our uncertainty in our fit is 10 to the minus 4. Um, so that's really, really impressive. Um, and we've only got something like, what is it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 10 points in our peak. But we can still fit the centre very, very well. And that's a feature of diffraction data, and that means we can fit uh, lattice parameters very, very well um, and uh, uh, use this for things like strain measurement, where strains would be typically elastic strains, quite small numbers, something like 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4 in size. But we have uncertainties that are uh, very, very good, so we can use this as a good tool for measuring strains in materials, and that's very, very nice. So that's how easy fitting can be uh, in MATLAB. And... Uh, only takes a few clicks and a few moments and uh, we're off and it's really really simple that's really really pleasing hopefully so see you next time